Everybody. Paloma, you're running things today, right? You're one of them. Ooh, she's frozen. I'll send a text, a chat. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Ooh. I'm in my video off. Sorry, Dan, go ahead. Oh. I was just going to say, I'll just remind you that since there are three speakers today, we'll have to stick closely to time for everybody. Great, thank you. And uh, I'm just keeping my video off because I have some uh, activity issues. But um, welcome to the Warren Symposium. I just wanted to start and I apologize. Uh, connection isn't great. Um, do you have any announcements? Chapman about about Maine, and pass it over to Elise to summarize Sean's presentation first. Hi everyone. Um, so first, um, I'll just summarize the presentation we heard from Sean Burkle last week. So Sean gave a presentation on climate context for Maine's um, 2020 drought. Um, and Sean discussed how 2020 was a year of extremes with droughts across much of the US being one of many. Um, by early fall, Aroostook County was designated as a primary drought disaster area with a second, a second declaration for other countries following in October. Sean also provided an outlook for 2021 using both seven day stream flow charts and the US drought monitor showing that drought could reemerge. It is uncertain if there will be more short term droughts, but it is a distinct possibility. Significant challenges are being tackled here in Maine with the establishment of the Maine Climate Council and a, robo a robust climate adaptation plan. So thanks to Sean for his great presentation. And next, um, Paloma will talk about um, the other presentation from last week. Great. Um, thanks, Elise. So Rachel, we heard from Rachel Chapman as well last week. Uh, she is assistant professor of sustainable agriculture, and she spoke about the effects of the 2020 drought on agriculture producers. Rachel reported about a survey conducted last winter that was a collaboration between the School of Food and Ag, Department of Forestry, Cooperative Extension, and others. Um, where they interviewed uh, and gathered uh, survey data from 246 farmers across the state. And they used Qualtrics, which is an online survey platform that allows for branching logic and anonymity and analyze the data using our programming. And they found that while most respondents had enough water in a typical year, most respondents did not have enough in 2020. Um, dug wells were more at least run dry than drilled wells, and farmers intend to increase use and invest in supplies for household water use, irrigation, and livestock watering. So more is needed for some adaptive practices and financial assistance is needed for others. Through this survey, more detailed needs of farmers for drought resilience were, were understood. So today we will have three uh, uh, 12 minute talks, which just a couple minutes for uh, questions uh, after each talk. And I'll pass it over to Elise uh, to start off the introductions. Great, thank you. So first, um, I'll introduce our first speaker, Danielle Levesque. 
She is the assistant professor of mammalogy in mammalian health, and she's also my wonderful advisor. Um, and she will present on what comparative genomics can tell us about mammalian responses to climate change. So go ahead, Danielle. Great, thanks, Elise. I'm just gonna share my desktop and hope that works. Um, and I realize I had to pull a bit of a bait and switch on people today because um, I was hoping to have this paper submitted in the story a bit clearer at this point in time. Um, and so for those of you who aren't aware, I've recently joined um, the Zoonomia Consortium, which is a, a big, large mammal genomics project where they now have genomes for about 400 and somewhat species and slowly working our way through um, using these published genomes to try to learn a bit more about um, kind of everything to do with these species. And I realize I can't see the chat when my um, presentation's shared. So if that comments for me, I can't see anything. Um, but unfortunately, again, this is still a work in progress. And I should also say that the consortium usually meets at this time, which is why I have unfortunately missed more of the Born Symposium that I'd like. Very happy hey, it's on YouTube. Danielle, Danielle sorry yeah, to interrupt you. Uh, oh. Danielle, your slides are in uh, presenter mode right now. Yep. Oh, thank you. That's unfortunate. Uh, sorry, you'd think I'd figure out presenter mode by now. It should be this one. Is it fixed? Yep, that looks good. Okay, that is was bizarre. New problems every time. <laughs> Great. So basically what we've ended up doing instead of actually the genomics analysis that I was hoping to provide is more just um, building, slowly building these phenotypes for mammals to then be used hopefully in the next three weeks in the, in the genomics analysis. Um, so basically what I'm going to talk to everybody about today is the idea of the differences in body temperature in mammals, um, both in the kind of level they use. So here's an example of a red squirrel that has a relatively high body temperature of 38 de degrees Celsius. For reference, humans are around 37 or 36, uh, and then a tenrec that's significantly lower. And we've been playing with the sort of whole mammal phylogenies for this. And these are family level averages for all mammal families. And just to situate yourselves a little bit, the bottom are things like sloths and armadillos. Um, and then that red thing right in the middle are um, ungulates. The other really hot red lines are rabbits. And then there's the naked mole rat that's low and some bats. Uh, and primates are somewhere in between in the sort of mid range. And so basically, what I'm rather going to shift to today, since I don't have the full genomic story, is um, this idea of using body temperature and other parts of mammal um, physiology to look at the, this idea of thermal performance and how we can then use what we know about these different phenotypes to predict um, who's going to do well and who isn't going to do well with climate change. And so I um, recently had this paper published in the Journal of Experimental Biology that's been the work of um, a lot of work uh, on whether or not endotherms have thermal performance curves. So for, for those of you who aren't familiar with the ins and outs of thermal performance, um, a performance curve is basically just the idea that um, things operate better at different temperatures. And so here's the kind of classic example of a lizard thermal performance curve. So it's got an optimal temperature where it performs really well. Uh, and usually the, the body, the x-axis is always body temperature, and then the y-axis can be kind of anything you want it to be, uh, running speed, um, rate of feeding, that kind of thing. So there's an optimum, and then there's temperatures where they don't do well at the low, upper and lower critical maximum. And these have been used to varying degrees of success as a way to kind of link air temperature through looking at microclimate effect on body temperature to performance and then ultimately to fitness. And the idea is that you, you could use these to look at um, who's gonna do well and who isn't gonna do well with climate change. Although there's a bunch of caveats that, um, that colleagues and I have talked about elsewhere. Um, and so the question, do endotherms have these curves, is sort of yes. Um, the, obviously, there is a link between body temperature and performance in endotherms as well. And so if you think about it, um, if your fingers are really cold on a particular day, they're not going to be as good. Um, and so that's sort of what the far right graph is showing. It's the power output for mouse muscles over a range of temperatures. Uh, and then in the middle one, it's burrowing speed in the Namib golden, golden mole, which is um, an Afrotherian, so it was up in that top blue chunk in the phylogeny, um, and then running speeds of different marsupials compared to a lizard, which are those black squares. Um, 
it's kind of hard to test this though because it's really hard to get a mammal at a specific temperature and then also get it to perform because uh, mammals are endotherms so use um, uh, physiological and biochemical means to keep constant body temperatures so this part isn't usually as interesting and and often this whole link on the chain here between body temperature and performance in mammals is considered to be relatively sort of straightforward and, and flat um, so what else can we look at that might be useful in terms of this idea of performance curves or, or trying to link different um, characteristics to performance in mammals. And so I've sort of been arguing and trying to find a framework to construct this um, in terms of these thermoregulatory phenotypes. And so I think the first thing we should look at is the flexibility of body temperature regulation. So I showed that massive graph that had, um, actually I didn't explain what it was, was a histogram of all body temperatures of mammals that we had to that date. The problem is those were single temperature values. And if you look at what a tenric looks like. And so these are sort of multi-day histograms of body temperature. And so for the tenric, you could see in this particular instance, um, not much of a difference between active temperatures and resting temperatures, uh, but the red squirrel does. So depending on which value you wanna use in these equations, you're gonna get completely different. And also I'd argue that having really tight temperature regulation costs more than, um, than a kind of looser one. <laughs> and sorry, the Tenrec is a bad example to use for that particular example because they have very, very flexible body temperatures, but that's a different story. Um, and because I put it in my slide and I figure I should talk about a local animal, if we're talking about something like a flying squirrel, some of the work we've been doing in my lab and Elise is continuing doing a modeling component for her masters is uh, looking at this in some local mammals, including flying squirrels. And so what we found out for flying squirrels is they have very high activity uh, body temperatures when they're active, almost up in the 40s. Um, and then when they're resting, it is somewhat dependent on ambient temperatures because they're resting in these tree holes that are heating up, which causes this increase. Um, I'm just going to skip this next slide because it's less important. And so here's the where the red squirrel falls on this pattern. So some of what we've been doing in my lab is looking at the kind of costs of being really picky about where your body temperature is at, like us, versus being a lot more flexible, um, and and how that looks like both sort of on a day to day basis as well as say season changes seasonally and so forth. Um, the other thing we're trying to look at is, so I presented the curve looking at kind of running speed or energy use in lizards for temperature. Um, we can get this for metabolic heat production in mammals, but it's not necessarily a useful performance curve. And so another thing we do a lot in my lab is we put animals in boxes and we measure their metabolism. So here that's resting metabolic rate um, over a range of ambient temperatures to see when they start needing to use energy to keep a constant body temperature. Um, and so this gives us one value that can be somewhat useful sometimes, and that's the lower limit of the thermal neutral zone. But it's important to recognize that that really doesn't have much to do with performance. Um, so here's a tree shrew and a tenric, and ours is also somewhere around 25 degrees, but it basically just means that below that temperature, they need to use energy to stay um, cold, I mean, to stay warm. And so uh, just as an aside, this is definitely not a thermal performance curve. It's more like a sort of thermal comfort curve. Uh, and some colleagues of mine have presented the really great paper on all the ins and outs of how to model um, mammals with climate and how you can kind of use that for climate change um, in a really useful way. So the other part now that that's sort of just looking at resting rates, can we kind of look at activity? It's a little bit harder to get these values from a bunch of species. And so um, for some, uh, I should have explained this curve a little bit more, but basically the resting phase one is in blue. So where they're sleeping and when they're active, the kind of basal rate goes up because of activity. Um, and this also means that you need to start shivering and stuff at um, lower temperatures than if you're just kind of curled up in a ball or higher, sorry just curled up in a ball. Um, and so figuring out if species are going to stay in the phase that they currently are. So if they're nocturnal, are they going to stay nocturnal with, with climate change or vice versa? So in Australia, when it gets really hot, a lot of species move to completely act, um, nocturnal activities. But in some circumstances, um, it's a little bit harder for, for animals to do that. Um, and we have started to find some neat patterns when we're looking at these phenotypes between nocturnal and diurnal animals. Uh, and so coding this massive data set of mammal that based on the, of body temperatures compared to their activity pattern. What you can see is that nocturnal and crepuscular animals are all over the map. 
but to be diurnal, you have to have a relatively higher body temperature. And the benefit to that is it helps maintain a kind of difference between you and the environment. So there's always a gradient for heat to be lost from the body. Um, and other colleagues have taken this and made a really elegant model showing that um, activity time is going to affect responses to climate change and that diurnal species might be in a little bit more trouble. Um, although I'd argue that arboreal nocturnal species like um, flying squirrels that don't have much choice about where they're going to nest in the day and those nests might be warming up might also kind of be an issue. And the other problem with all of this is we don't understand how humidity impacts any of these. So a lot of what we're doing in my lab right now is building these data sets as well as a set of um, techniques to use for new species that we're again hoping to fit into this framework on um, comparative genomics. And I really hope that I'll have some concrete data to show you all uh, this time next year. And so I think I left time for questions um, and I'll stop there and I'll stop sharing my screen so I can see faces. Danielle. So if anyone has any questions, you can just unmute yourself and go ahead. Yeah, Hi, Danielle. Nice presentation. Um, I apologize. I did come in a few minutes uh, late from another meeting. Um, so I was just wondering a little bit more about uh, just curious because it's really interesting research about uh, you were talking about you were showing us some things with the flying squirrel in particular about some animals in Maine. I was just wondering, and I again, I apologize if I missed it in the first few minutes. Um, are there other species that's like particularly in Maine that your lab's looking at or thinking of looking at going forward? Yeah, so so part of what we're doing is trying to see how much any of this has to play with range distributions. And the flying squirrels are an easy one because they can fit in boxes. Um, and because the, the southern one has been moving up and out competing the northern one. Uh, and we think that, that this overheating during the day might have a role to play in it. We haven't been able to get the kind of data on the northerns yet because of just logistics. We finally found them up in Presque Isle because when I first moved here, everybody was like, oh, there's northerns on campus, you're fine. And we had the Holt Forest down in Bath where we knew they'd switched over in um, the early 2000s. And so we thought we had our nice two species study set up. And then it turns out that no, they're already way north of here. So I got money from the Maine Outdoor Heritage Fund to go and try to find where the northerns stop and the southerns begin in the state this summer. So that's another kind of watch this space. And I think Elise might present a little bit um, on her stuff before she leaves as well. So I'll make sure that CCI gets her thesis defense announcement this summer. But yeah, and we're also looking at deer mice, but the problem is um, larger mammals are a little more logistically harder to, to do these questions with. I'm working my way up to snowshoe hares because I think that'd be really fun. Hey, Danielle, I have a kind of a weird question. Sure. Um, what about the relationships between like temperature and precipitation and thinking about the changing seasonality of precipitation? Does that, does that matter or how does that come into play? Yes, <laughs> I think it does. And that's the part of the problem when we're looking at responses to heat is that we still don't quite understand how um, humidity plays into thermoregulation or energetics period because mm -hmm. a lot of it's been done in sort of dry boxes in the lab. Um, but when it comes to changing seasonality, I think the impact on food is going to kind of trump a lot of other things. But um, right. Alice Boyle, who's at, I think, Kansas University, has a really great tree paper on the hybrid niches of endotherms that kind of works Whoa. into that. Yeah, I'll send it to you. It's really cool. Um, so other people have thought about it, and I'm still kind of working out how to fit this into things. First, I'm working on the kind of organism side of it and then trying to get it into the macro framework is the next step that I'm super excited about. <laughs> but yeah, great question. Thank you. <laughs> 
Any other questions for Danielle? Okay, well, if there are no other questions, thank you, Danielle, for your great presentation. Um, and Paloma will introduce the next speaker if um, she's still here and if her connection is working. It's working okay right now. Thank you, Elise. Okay. So it's my pleasure to introduce Bonnie Newsom, who is an assistant professor of anthropology. And she'll be talking to us about recent investigations of early ceramics at the Turner Farm site, North Haven Island, Maine. The floor is yours, Bonnie. Thank you very much. Does that look okay? Since the beginnings of archaeological inquiry in Maine, research on Aboriginal ceramics has been overshadowed by topics such as indigenous mortuary practices, lithic technologies, seasonality studies, and faunal remains. Research on Aboriginal ceramics has been less forthcoming, and this has resulted in a skewed data set that inhibits our ability to understand the lives of indigenous peoples living during the ceramic period, which covers a 3,000 year time period just prior to European colonization. And it was during this time that indigenous peoples in Maine first integrated clay pots into their life ways, marking one of the most uh, visible and important material culture shifts in regional archeology. span Early potters in Maine approached their craft in similar ways to their neighbors across, um, excuse me, across New England and into New York and Canada, creating uh, clay pots with very similar traits. The, the first ceramics in Maine resemble the New York Bennett one type as defined by Ritchie and McNeish in 1949. And they exhibit characteristics such as cordage impressed interior and exterior surfaces, coarse grit temper, straight walls, uh, conoidal bases and rounded or sometimes pointed rims. Pottery classified as Vinette One is distributed broadly across the northeastern U.S. and Canada. This map by Taché and her uh, colleagues show the distribution of pottery classified as uh, Vinette One. And presently, I'm conducting a comparative study on these early ceramics from multiple sites in the Penobscot River Valley. And today, I'll discuss some recent findings from this study, primarily focusing on the Turner Farm site in North Haven Island, Maine. In 1973, uh, archaeologists working in the Maine Maritimes region agreed to a moratorium on uh, Maine types. And at that time, Maine archaeological chronologies and interpretations were uh, underdeveloped. And regional archaeologists wanted to resist the importation of typological constructs from other regions. And despite this, the Vinette One construct and its defining uh, suite of attributes have influenced Maine maritime ceramic analyses and interpretations. And pottery is often labeled as Vinette One um, and it's referenced that way uh, frequently in the literature. In 1991, Peterson and Sanger developed a regional chronology for Aboriginal ceramics. And they acknowledged similarities between the first Aboriginal ceramics in Maine in the Vinette One type. And they interpret the shared ceramic traits as a horizon style, indicative of widespread uh, social interaction. Yet the influence of the Vinette One construct across the Northeast um, resulted in few efforts to differentiate how potters approach their craft. And this in turn has uh, inhibited our understanding of sociocultural dynamics associated with the initial manufacture and use of ceramics in the region. In order to look beyond this normative concept of the Vinette One Horizon style, I've undertaken a comparative study of early ceramics in the Penobscot River Valley. And the aim of this study is to highlight ceramic variability, acknowledge it indigenous agency, and advance our understanding of the sociocultural dimensions of uh, the first pottery. And I do this through um, a comparative analysis of early ceramics from 10 archaeological sites in the Penobscot River Valley in central Maine. I use two primary analytical techniques in this study. One is an attribute analysis of technological choice where 
I examined taught characteristics such as uh, surface treatments, pace characteristics, and morphological attributes. And by examining these traits, we can uh, reveal variability in potter's choices along the ceramic uh, production uh, sequence. Analyses of encrusted food remains on some shirts provided uh, additional information in terms of AMS dates and determining what pots were used for. One key to understanding why people began making and using clay pots is identifying what they were used for. And there are multiple ways to get at this information. For this particular study, I used uh, FTIR. And FTIR is an analytical technique that uses infrared light on residue samples to event identify organic materials and to observe their chemical properties. This technique has become a uh, fairly commonplace for identifying what was cooked in a pot and is useful particularly for distinguishing uh, plant versus uh, meat signatures. And there's been some debate uh, in, Northe in the Northeast about what uh, the first pots were used for. Several studies on early ceramic residues by uh, Kareem Tashe indicate that pots were used for simmering fish. And she suggests that native peoples were processing fish oil. Some recent residue studies of early ceramics from the Great Lakes region show more diversity uh, with residue studies identifying plant and animal remains as well as nut oils. Data from this study will add to the archeological dialogue on this topic. <clears throat> I want to turn now to the Turner Farm site, and this site is located on North Haven Island in Penobscot Bay. It's one of the oldest coastal sites in Maine. It's a multi-component shell heap site with a large late archaic cemetery component that includes multiple uh, types of mortuary rituals. Native families lived at this location from uh, the late archaic through the late ceramic period, roughly 5,000 to 450 years ago. In archaeological research at this site focused heavily on the late arch archaic period component in lithic and uh, faunal assemblages. Ceramics from the site span uh, the ceramic period roughly 3,000 years, but very little published data on this assemblage is, exists. That's a lot from the three um, areas uh, within the study show remarkable similarity in several traits, including average body thickness, rim thickness, and, and lip shape. Likewise, uh, rim thickness measurements taken one centimeter below the lip show little variation based on site location, measuring an average of 7.97 millimeters in the central sample and 8.03 millimeters in the coastal sample. Additionally, potters at all three locations practice secondary smoothing on vessel surfaces, whereby they smooth over the cordage. Um, and given the endless options that people have in manipulating clay to meet their needs, understanding the social and cultural meaning behind these similarities is important. However, uh, despite these similarities, evaluations of the Turner Farm early ceramic collection has revealed some notable distinctions. The first is the size of the ceramic sample at the site. Generally, sites with early ceramic period pots have very few containers, usually less than 10. And you can see here that this is the case for all of the sites in the Penobscot River Valley, except for Turner Farm, where uh, four, 24 vessel lots were identified. And this high number could be related to a difference in preservation. It could also reflect uh, the temporal span of site use or the numbers of people using the site during the early uh, ceramic period. And currently it's unclear why this site produced so many vessel lots compared to the other sites in the Penobscot River Valley. In terms of vessel morphology, um, these samples are, our sizes are small, but that's the way we have to work in Maine archeology, span unfortunately. Um, but uh, samples from the Penobscot River Valley show some similarities across the three locations. And this is not the case for uh, rim version where uh, the central and coastal uh, samples differ. Specifically, um, vessel lots with direct rims dominate the central sample and excavate rims dominate the coastal sample. And this variation may reflect a fun functional difference between the two samples um, as excavate rims are typically designed for pouring and they allow easier access to the pot's contents than a rim that is direct or curves in. One final ceramic attribute that's worth noting here is cordage twist. When uh, producing cordage, there are two options with respect to spin and twist, either S spin Z twist or Z spin S twist. 
The two techniques are distinguished by uh, the angle of cordage, which may be visible on the surface uh, of fabric where cordage impressed clay pots. Peterson and Hamilton observed that uh, the coastal and interior twist distinction in their analysis of um, 26 main sites, and they suggested that differences in cordage twist preference is indicative of different social groups. And chronologically, uh, Peterson identified uh, discontinuities in coastal and interior cordage twist patterns during the early ceramic period, and then again um, between 1350 and 950 BP, suggesting a coastal preference for Z twist um, and an interior pre preference for S twist. The results of the Penobscot River Valley um, early ceramic analysis do not align with these coastal and interior twist patterns. Um, S-twist cordage is most common on early ceramics in all three samples, including the Turner Farm uh, sample. And here you can see an example of the S-twist cordage on uh, rim, Rimshur from Turner Farm. With respect to residue analysis, uh, radiocarbon dates um, on Turner Farm residues were obtained from two different labs. Conventional radiocarbon agents, ages from both labs are similar with beta analytic returning a conventional age of 2510 plus or minus 30 and Paleo Research Institute returned five conventional age dates ranging from 2455 to 2675 BP. Interestingly, these are more consistent with previous dates obtained on marine samples than on those uh, obtained on wood charcoal. This is a summary of uh, other early ceramic period dates from the Penobscot River Valley, and they range roughly from 2920 to 2020 BP, all of which come from associated charcoal and not residues. FTIR results of the residues from Turner Farm pottery show uh, peaks typical of proteins and amino acids, which um, the analysts at Paleo Research Institute interpreted as meat, which is no surprise. Um, the next step will be uh, to attempt to identify the type of meat. And faunal analyses by Spies and Lewis at Turner Farm report changes in faunal remains between the late archaic occupation and the ceramic period occupation. And specifically, uh, faunal data show an increasing evidence of seal hunting beginning in uh, the er early ceramic period. And they also note an increased reliance on moose, beaver, flounder, sturgeon, and bird. And the morphology of the early pottery at this site would support uh, practices such as simmering meat or processing seal fat for oil, which may or may not require heat. Additionally, early ceramic vessel lots in this location show a preference for feldspar rich inclusions or temper, which are optimal for cooking pots because feldspar has a similar thermal coefficient to clay. In the combination of uh, excavate rims, feldspar inclusion in the vessel lots at Turner Farm support the interpretation that early uh, ceramics served as cooking pots. However, determining whether or not they were used to cook uh, seal or process blubber or fish for oil or to cook something else altogether remains to be tested. In closing, it's clear from this study that potters within the Penobscot River Valley shared a common heritage and uh, Peterson and Sanger's early ceramic uh, horizon style seems appropriate. Ceramic vessels from the three areas were not so distinct that one would recognize them as being made by culturally disassociated potters. In fact, the potters living dur during the early ceramic period in the Penobscot River Valley made nearly identical choices with regard to uh, rim thickness, body thickness, and surface treatment at the three locations. However, some variability in potter's choices is evident when examined through a technological lens, and whether those choices are linked to pottery function, availability of resources, or other cultural factors remains unresolved. So several uh, results from the study are notable. Uh, Turner Farm ceramic. Uh, early ceramic period cordage twist data are inconsistent with previously identified distinctions in coastal and interior sites in Maine. Residues from early ceramic period pots from the Turner Farm site indicate that they were used for um, to cook meat, not nuts or plants as seen in other parts of the Northeast. And finally, AMS dates on residues from the Turner Farm early ceramic period pottery range from 2455 to 2675 BP. Uh, this re research is ongoing and additional residue studies are planned. I'd like to acknowledge the following entities, and these are the sources that supported this 
presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, excuse me, Bob, it's Peter Coons here. Mm -hmm. um, I was uh, interested in your uh, statement that clay and, and feldspar had similar thermal properties. From a geophysicist perspective, I'm sort of curious which ones they were and, and uh, how were they you, they were determined. Well, which, what do you mean, which? Um... Well, are they the thermal conductivity, diffusivity? It's just normally I, I would think of clays as as having some similarities, but also there's stuff full of water. And so I'm just curious at what point they'd be similar. Yeah. That's uh, data out of um, Owen Rye's work. And I'm afraid I can't answer the specifics on that. Um, uh, but I, what I can say is that feldspars are, tend to be used worldwide in, in pottery because of oh, yeah. their, um, uh, what, I understand as being um, optimal uh, yeah. inclusions for cooking and firing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. I'll, I'm, I'm interested and I'll, I'll take a look at that. Thank you. Yeah. So Bonnie, I was, I was interested in the uh, analysis of, of residue. And if, if I understood properly, you said that all the results came out to be different kinds of meat and not nuts or plants. Would the technique have identified plant foods? It's supposed to, um, according to paleo research. And she's identified um, some plant remains in, at some other sites that I've uh, done tests on. Eddington Bend, in particular, I think had some plant um, evidence of plants. So, but for the most part, all of the Penobscot River um, residues seem to be leaning towards meat. And we don't know if it's fish meat or terrestrial meat. That's one thing we've got to work on. Interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions for Bonnie? OK, well, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our final speaker, Cindy Eisenhower, Associate Professor of Anthropology and Climate Change. And she is going to tell us about Saving the Adaptation Fund, Defending Justice-Based Norms in Climate Finance Post-Paris. The floor is Cindy. Thank you so much. Can I just get an um, auditory confirmation that you guys can see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Okay, well, um, first of all, thanks um, to everyone for um, what a great born symposium this semester. It's been really fun. I've really appreciated it. So thanks to all the organizers. Um, so, oh, I realize I'm on the end of my slides here. Um, so I wanna present on some work that I did with Anna McGinn, who it, I hopefully you all remember, um, graduated a few years ago with a dual degree um, from SPIA and from the Climate Change Institute. Um, we just, after working on a paper for quite a while, managed to get it published in climate policy. So we're both very happy about that. So I'll be telling you about that process and some of our findings. So um, it starts with a story around the Paris Agreement and how Paris marked, um, I'm sure many of you are already are aware of this, marked a rather significant change in the international climate negotiations. So of course it was internationally celebrated because for the first time we had legally binding targets for all nations. Um, prior to that, we had a more of a staged approach based on this idea that countries had common but differentiated responsibilities. And that was based on past emissions, current emissions, but also respective capacities, which is what the RC stands for. So prior to Paris, um, the developed countries were supposed to act first and then developing countries later. So with Paris, we got all countries on board, um, but that was in part based on this promise of significant adequate funding to make um, domestic mitigation and adaptation possible for developing countries. So an important kind of part of the backstory here. Um, those, that funding that would be transferred from developed countries into developing contexts flows through a whole bunch of different mechanisms. Um, through the UN, 
process, it flows through three major modalities. So the Global Environmental Facility, the Adaptation Fund, and the Green Climate Fund. So one of the things that Anna and I became really interested in, and I should give Anna credit here, this is, <clears throat> this is um, something that she followed much more closely than I did, um, was the Adaptation Fund. So when Paris was agreed to, um, all of the mechanisms for funding underneath Paris had to be renegotiated. So should they continue to serve the Paris Agreement, um, be transferred over from the Kyoto Protocol and into this new decision? Well, something interesting happened. So um, in the, the Paris Agreement, it says that the Global um, Climate Fund or the Green Climate Fund, the Global Environmental Facility and then the Lesser Developed Countries Fund shall serve the agreement. Now, if you follow the UNFCCC, you know that shall is a legal term and, and, and that's legally binding. But the adaptation fund, it said in their decision, it said may, which is not the same, right? So it's not a legally um, legal term. It, it, it doesn't hold any legal weight. Legal weight. It just meant this, that it might, but we're not sure yet. Well, this decision threw a lot of um, parties into a significant Fury, I, I guess is the right way to say it. <laughs> so there was um, established an ad hoc working group on the Paris Agreement that um, met consistently over the next few years at the Conference of Parties and in intersessionals to try to figure out what exactly is the role of the Adaptation Fund in serving the Paris Agreement. So one of the things that I want to kind of put at the base of this story is that Anna and I really um, noted that Developing countries spent an incredible amount of time, energy, passionate interventions, right, when they speak up during negotiations, um, political capital, and delegate members to defend the adaptation fund. And so we really wanted to try to understand why that was, um, why, why, why they should do that. And part of the reason that we asked that question is because many of the developing countries, granted, they pull themselves together in negotiating blocks um, so that they have more um, weight. But many developing countries have extremely small delegations. So when you look at the delegations from some of the world's most impoverished but also vulnerable countries, some of them just have a handful of people there. And you compare that to you know, delegations from the United States or the EU or Canada who just have hundreds of people that can attend simultaneous and parallel meetings and so many of these small state delegations are just completely overworked. They can't be in multiple places at once and it's really frustrating. So um, despite that, we saw that they really, many developing countries really focus their energies on the adaptation fund. But that raises some really interesting questions, um, partially in view of some of the most dominant theories in international relations, which, and um, you see my disclaimer here, I'm gonna be way overly simplistic here, but just for the, <laughs> I'm happy to uh, nuance this for people who wanna talk more about it later, but there tend to be two really dominant theories in international relations. And this goes back to the kind of Hobbes versus Rousseau, you know, age old debate of are humans essentially selfish or are we cooperative? <laughs> but um, it's rationalism and realism. This is the idea that um, nations are gonna utilize cost benefit analyses were rational to maximize national interest. And in this perspective, uh, it, it doesn't make sense. And let me tell you in, why in a second. And then there's this idea of liberalism is that people um, fund or nations fundamentally act um, through, to try to find mutual advantages so that we can get to collective interests. And the problem was is that in trying to understand why developing countries were putting so much emphasis on the adaptation fund, Anna and I didn't feel like either one of these theories made a whole lot of sense. So let me explain why. So first of all, I know this is a complex slide, but if you start on the left-hand side, you're gonna see um, kind of total um, global climate finance. Um, you can see the breakdown in 2016 from public and private funders. But if you follow that um, flow diagram at the, at the bottom of the left-hand side, you can see that the majority of funding is going toward um, the renewable energy transition, sustainable transport, energy efficiency. And if you look all the way to the left, you'll see that adaptation funding is just a very small piece of the total global, uh, global clim climate finance um, um, total flows. And then if you look on, on the right, you can see um, in the um, 
bubbles that if these are um, all of the different funds used to um, finance adaptation. You can see the adaptation fund in the green at the top is fairly small, particularly compared to the green climate fund and the least developed countries fund. So from a rationalist perspective, this didn't make much sense, right? <laughs> We've got people that are already overtaxed investing a significant portion of their um, attention and effort at the negotiations to defend a fund that compared to some of the other funds that had already been um, attached to the Paris Agreement um, provided relatively meager finance. So what um, this paper is based on is um, a kind of classic narrative analysis and observation. Um, at the meetings. So we read through decision texts from um, 2015 through the finalized Paris rulebook um, from Katowice. We also read through party submissions. So um, prior to the negotiations, each party can send in um, their position um, submissions. And then of course, observations. So um, Anna went to COP 21 through 25. I went through to 23 to 25. So in total, this was 53 days um, of observations in these negotiating um, meetings, listening to countries give interventions and make pleas for um, the adaptation fund. I'm not gonna read these to you, but um, here are just some quotes as you're, that you can kind of peruse for a minute um, coming from, many of the developing countries who, um, this is a, a large part of how we make our argument um, through qualitative analysis of these quotes, where we see over and over um, developing countries um, talking about how import important adaptation fund is, how um, essential it is for developing countries to continue the adaptation fund under the Paris Agreement. So part of the story um, to answer our question of why they spent so much on the adaptation fund um, has to do with the way that the adaptation fund was set up. So its goal, like the lesser developed um, countries fund, was to help particularly vulnerable communities and developing countries adapt to climate change. So it's specific, the funding is specific to adaptation and it's specific um, to vulnerable communities. But more importantly, um, what we found is that when we read through all of these quotes, all of the, the passionate interventions that countries made on behalf of the fund, it really had to do that with the idea that the adaptation fund is, is the only funding mechanism that has majority representation on the board from developing countries. So rather than it being the, fi the financiers um, who are kind of controlling um, the fund, it is um, much more representative um, for those countries who will receive funds. It also established the idea of direct access so that rather than having to go through third party actors, countries could access the funding themselves. Um, and also it was one of the first funds to set up really strong social and environmental safeguards. So um, when funding was received, there were safeguards in place to make sure that it wasn't, for example, um, unfairly burdening indigenous populations or certain genders. So the adaptation fund was really seen as a major win for developing countries. And that was based on this idea um, that it gave procedural justice through the representation on the board, but also distributive justice in that, you know, it was really based on targeting particularly vulnerable countries who had, don't have a big climate footprint. They haven't contributed much to climate change, but would be differentially impacted. So, um, one of the things that Anna and I did when we started to try to um, answer the question of why they, the countries had invested so much is of course we, um, like all good scholars, looked for a pretty significant literature review. And one of the things we found is that um, scholars of the UNF C process and climate negotiations in general and actually global environmental politics more broadly have noted that over the past 10 to 15 years, we've seen a shift in the justice-based norms of a lot of our international regimes. So um, many of them were founded on this idea of distributed and procedural justice, as in the idea of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capacities, and are moving much more toward liberal conceptualizations of justice, where voluntary rational actors um, work toward a mutual advantage. Um, and so rather than thinking about structural shifts, it's about kind of voluntary cooperation. Um, and this is really evident in the Paris Agreement, which is based on, yes, everybody has, has legally binding targets, but those targets are determined voluntarily. Um, 
and, and at the country's own discretion. So in the end, our primary argument is that um, from COP 22 to 24, developing countries were able to basically craft a narrative about the adaptation fund that made it a referendum on justice-based norms under international climate regimes. Um, they did this through significant time, significant effort invested. But we find that rather than thinking about um, this defense through rationalist or liberal theory, we find um, constructivist regime, regime theory to be the most useful actually And after we've read through all of these empirical, this empirical data. And this has to do with kind of a post Paris um, contestation of what normative behaviors are in international regimes. How should people act? What's the right way to act? And so the, um, the adaptation fund kind of became this like flashpoint where countries that had given um, kind of moved more, agreed to move more toward more liberal norms um, under Paris um, are holding on to something um, to ensure that they get that funding, to ensure that they get that access and have true procedural justice um, in order to make the Paris Agreement work. So um, Anna and I ultimately argue that, um, you know, claims to distributive and procedural justice um, become emblematic of larger concerns about justice-based norms that have to be addressed in order to ensure the ultimate success of the Paris Agreement. And so while there are hundreds of other negotiated rooms happening and <laughs> many other kind of pieces of the Paris Agreement on carbon trading, on um, agriculture, and on indigenous people's platforms, there are so many things going on. But um, it was interesting that such a small fund became kind of the key linchpin, I guess one could say, for thinking about how the Paris Agreement might proceed in a way that was seen as just um, for, the, for many of the developing countries who had, um, through Paris, uh, worked toward cooperation, but at, at risk of, of um, seeing those distributive and procedural justice frames um, fade away. So uh, that's all I have. And I think I've left some good time for questions. I did just wanna say thanks um, to the Dana Betty Churchill Exploration Fund, which helped to fund Anna attending these meetings and to um, the NSF Convergence Program for funding my trips to the COP. And that's it. Thanks everybody. Happy to take questions or comments if anyone has them. Uh, hi, uh, uh, this is Dan. Um, I just wanted to ask whether, Cindy, whether you think that the focus of the developing countries on the adaptation fund, it being this sort of emblematic fund for them, is, is, is fully rational. In other words, is there a return to them in, uh, in this focus? Well, certainly, yeah. But I think, you know, when in so much of the common kind of rationalist theory, the idea is that it would be linked to money. Um, but I think, you know, it's complex. Yeah, it's rational for sure. Um, but if you think about the rationality of spending so much time on such a small fund <laughs> compared to the rationality of spending time on funds that would bring potentially a lot more gain, um, and that's why that that's kind of what led Anna and I to question whether it was rational. But yeah, I think it is, Dan. It, it's we we can't cut out rationalist or realist theory completely, right? It, it gives a part of the explanation. Um, but I think more important here is that it was really rational for them in the context of an international regime that seemed to be moving in a liberal direction um, that wasn't providing them with kind of a just solution especially considering that so much of the funding that was promised is just not coming through. Thank you, Cindy. Thanks, Dan. Cindy, uh, very nice presentation, very informative. Um, moving ahead to COP in Glasgow, what do you think will be some of the big issues? Hmm. Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I think that the global stock take is going to be a, a big issue. Um, so the, the, the way that Paris was set up is, as I said, it's 
countries have to make um, nationally determined contributions, right? And so the idea is that you put forward your nationally determined contributions is what you're going to promise to do. And some of them are conditional on finance and some of them aren't. Well, pr the problem is, is that we have this huge mitigation gap, right? That if you add up all the NDCs and see where they add up to relative to what we need to get to, to avoid two two degrees or even one, especially 1.5, they fall super short. And part of the um, design of the Paris Agreement was that there would be a global stock take um, every five years and that then um, countries would be required to increase their ambition. And um, all of the uh, mechanisms for the global stock take aren't quite set up yet. Um, so that's gonna be a, a big piece of the puzzle. I continue to think that um, the, the carbon me trading mechanism is so article six, which has been kind of the sticking point for negotiations over the past, since Paris. I mean, they, they had to essentially in Katowice push it off um, because they couldn't, there were, there were still too many bracketed areas of text. So that's gonna continue to be a big issue. Um, what else? I think loss and damage is gonna continue to be a big issue. Um, this, this is another kind of flashpoint for developing countries that wanna see some compensatory justice um, for loss and damage. Do you think there's any chance there'll ever be one for loss and damage? But yeah, I certainly think there's a chance, um, but I think that a lot of parties are gonna fight it tooth and nail <laughs> to the very end. So uh, I don't see a big chance, but I think there's a chance for it. And it may be that those loss and damage funds come through a different mechanism uh, that's set up a bit differently. Is there um, much of a uh, an Arctic uh, theme in this? I assume there'll be much more in Glasgow. Yes, it, so there's always a lot of stuff on the cryosphere and um, at the meetings. So for those of you um, who don't follow, not only are there negotiation sessions ongoing at the COPS, but there are side events. It's like a regular conference and um, We've been taking delegations for the past few years and one of our ultimate goals with getting humane observer status is that we can participate in a much more robust way through research presentations and side events that we organize. Um, so yeah, there, there's an, a, usually the, um, I can't remember the name of the organization. Some of you would know better than me, but there, is there like an Arctic Studies Cryosphere International Association? Uh, there are several. The, my, the Arctic Circle is probably one of the the most representative of what's going on uh, across all disciplines, including business. So they are usually in the pavilion space. Like countries have pavilions, but there's usually a really big pavilion space that's dedicated to the cryosphere, and they hold talks just constantly. But I, I'm not exactly sure who the um, right. like the, the agency is that hosts that. I can look at it. Obviously, is very big because you have the Arctic as one type of problem, and then you have high mountain areas with water towers. That's another type of problem, and then of course you also have have the Antarctic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thank you, mm -hmm. um, Cindy. In what ways do you think the Biden administration decision to rejoin will will affect the upcoming um, talks in, in Glasgow? I think it's pretty significant. Um, a, a lot of the peer-reviewed literature um, that has kind of tracked the regime over time, um, some scholars that have been going to these meetings forever <laughs> um, have remarked that we were kind of in a holding pattern for a couple of years. A lot of countries didn't, weren't particularly interested in raising their ambitions significantly until they knew what was gonna happen. Um, so I think it's, I think it's big. I, I really do. And I think um, it will be interesting to see what also happens bilaterally with the US and China. Um, because that was, I mean, to a certain extent, that was kind of the flashpoint for a long time is, you know, were, were the developing um, BRIC countries, uh, rapidly developing countries going to get a competitive advantage in a market system <clears throat> if we uh, really raised our ambitions significantly and they didn't. But um, I think, I think we're seeing a lot of news out of Asia um, and even India now that, that people are ready to move. So hopefully we will be too. Let's hope. Yeah. Thanks for the questions. <laughs>
Well, if there are no more questions, I'll just I'll give my quick summary. I know people have to leave, so go ahead, but I'll just take a minute or two. So Danielle intended to present on genomics, but the progress of research threw her a curve. She demonstrated flexibility by pivoting to an energetic discussion about how mammals can run hot or cold and what that means for their performance under different thermal conditions. One of her slides suggests that when animals are chilling, they start shivering at a warmer temperature than when they are active, which is a cool result. Moving on to Bonnie, as an archeologist, me, who grew up in the 1960s, I can say that I really dug Bonnie's talk. She gave a well-tempered presentation about early pottery at the turn of farm site and throughout the Northeast. She sees a new perspective on the horizon that will help us get beyond the normative approach that has dominated the field. Getting to the meat of the matter, part of her work uses spectroscopy to determine what the pots were used to cook, giving us real food for thought. As an anthropologist, Bonnie presented a thick description of pottery rims. Cordage marks impressed on the pots added a new twist to her analysis. In general, Bonnie, Bonnie's study of pottery gives us lots to consider. Moving on to Cindy, Cindy's talk was right on the money on the issues of raising the adaptation fund pro promise at the Paris conference. A major question is whether all of the intended funders agree that we'll always have Paris. And what does that actually mean? Her analysis together with Anna McGinn does justice to, how, to the how and why of developing countries being so concerned with the adaptation fund and makes a powerful statement about how to better understand these processes. Thank you, everybody. See you next week. Thanks all.